burned out. Let me check on that real quick. We'll but you're saying we're check. broadcasting and we're free to go? Uh, give us one minute just to check on that. Okay, thank you. After two years, the light is burned out. Okay, note to self. <clears throat> All right, I will call this Tigard City Council and Local Contract Review Board meeting to order. I want to welcome everyone to our first hybrid meeting. This does mean that some people will be attending in person and some virtually. Uh, this is our first meeting in this format in two and a half years. Um, this is the first council business meeting that Councilor Shaw and many of our City of Tigard teammates have had the opportunity to attend in person. And um, it is great to be back in Town Hall, and I think everyone is excited. There's a little, little bit of a feel of nostalgia and excitement tonight, so uh, thank you everybody for making this happen. And with that, uh, City Recorder Krager, please call roll. Youth Councilor Nog. Here. Councilor Goodhouse. Here. Councilor Newton. Here. Council President Lube. Here. Councilor Shaw. Here. Mayor Snyder. Here. All right, with that, I will ask everyone to join in the Pledge of Allegiance. And for the first time in two and a half years, we're going to do it live. Councilor staff, any non-agenda items? No items from us, Mr. Mayor. All right. We have no proclamations or recognitions tonight. Uh, we'll move into the public comments section. I think the first item on that agenda is an update from Chief McAlpine. Good to see you in person. Well, and to you, Mayor and Councilor, again, Police Chief Kathy McAlpine for the July dashboard. But first, as always, I, I like to be timely and relevant, and I want to thank all of you and to our community members that may be listening on what I would consider a very successful national night out um, that happened uh, last week. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I really enjoyed the connections. Uh, it was a smaller one coming out of COVID. We had 12 uh, communities that signed up, and as you know, you all made it, we all made it, our presence known. But we really focus on quality over quantity. And so for the first time, I felt like I could actually stay for more than 10 minutes because I was worried about trying to get to the next one and really had some great conversations. And so I think it's encouraging to see uh, our neighbors re-engage uh, not only with each other, but uh, with all of us as well. So we look forward to, to next year's getting even bigger. Um, but we did hear from one uh, group that was, Children were a little disappointed that we did not have candy, and so it should be noted for the record that uh, some Tigard police personnel delivered candy today uh, and, and uh, made a few of the kids happy. So on to more pressing, the July. It, Mike, if you would be so kind as to put up the uh, slide. I hate to say it as he's pulling it up, but it is focusing on what I call the big three. That's the person crimes, property crimes, and calls for service. Um, that, that trend is still continuing to move forward. Um, if, you, if the slide doesn't, oh, he's got it, okay. Um, so property crime is what I'm really focusing on, and we're still taking up 42% uh, from last year. And what we're really seeing, besides the organized retail theft, is just people feeling emboldened and blatant of just walking into retail stores, not even trying to conceal it, but just going out. Uh, just the other day, it was two grocery carts and a refrigerator that they just walked out with. Um, when a retail store does happen to have loss prevention, we're seeing them get assaulted, having weapons pulled on them. Last week, we had one loss prevention person that lost part of their ear due to a combatant person they were trying to take into custody. Very concerning behavior, um, all what we consider supposedly property crimes and nonviolent in this behavior. I think if you recall last month, I, I talked about how we were simply contacting uh, individuals believed to be 
uh, shoplifting in a store and they rammed two of our patrol cars before we could even really contact them. So, uh, and this is just not unique again to Tigard. We're, we're seeing that across the country, this emboldenment, this. Um, but it's different than before COVID, right? Oh yes, yeah, this, this, we can't, you know, pin this on COVID. Um, it is, you know, whether it's just feeling like, um, I, I would say the, the think the lack that law enforcement can do anything to them, being mm -hmm. held accountable and feeling like, you know, uh, they can get away with it. Um, but, you know, we still investigate. We have a phenomenal commercial crimes unit. Um, it's just a little harder if they're reporting an after fact and they're long gone as opposed to in progress or they have them detained. Um, but those are our challenges. Um, you've seen the, the news releases on the updates when we did, I think it just came out uh, yesterday and we did an interview today. The commercial crimes unit did a joint venture with Fred and Meyer on a, a what we call a retail blitz. It was very successful. So we'll continue to be proactive as well and try and hold people accountable um, in the areas that we can. I would also ask you to just keep an eye on Senate Bill 48 that passed. It came into effect July 1st of 2022, and that was the bail reform. And again, that goes to, um, I think, in, a, in an attempt to, to create some uh, equity or uh, address inequities in our bail system. Um, what they're really focusing on, those who are in violent crimes, maybe they aren't privileged enough to bail out and they'll stay longer. But those who have done property crimes or other crimes that are not considered to be deemed dangerous to the community, they may just get uh, PR'd or uh, personal recognizance. That's the one I want to watch and see what happens to our crime, especially our property crimes. Yes, you know, it, um, it impacts us in other ways, may not fall under person's crime until they assault a loss prevention, but it still is a concern to me, and I definitely will be um, working with the DA Barton on this to see what the impacts, but I just want to kind of draw your attention and our community to that. And then, uh, as I said, the dispatch calls for service are, are trending seven, almost 8%, which, which equates to about a thousand more calls for service than we did last time at this year. And as you know, with the, with the levy where we, we have those eight officers, we're just, we filled those, we've trained them or they're in the academy but we've had people either leaving the profession or lateraling to another agency. And we just had one leave this month uh, to go to another agency. So those are our challenges. The good news is I've given four conditional offers, three entry, one uh, lateral. Uh, the bad news is uh, the soonest we can get them into the academy is now not till February, if we're fortunate. And, um, you know, just, and they still have the background psychological and, um, uh, medical and the psychological is, is probably six to eight weeks out just even getting them scheduled for that. So there are a few things that are outside of our control, um, but we're, we're plowing ahead and I will keep you all informed. And at that point, I will be happy to answer any questions. Well, Chief, I will just on that last point, I will make sure you're aware because I, I haven't connected with you about this directly, but um, the mayor of Gresham is also deeply concerned about the academy access, and I think they've actually successfully lobbied to have a couple of additional classes, academy classes added recently, and then are going to be pushing the um, the legislature to fund additional positions at the academy to make sure that what you're describing is not what we all are experiencing as agencies. So just as a heads up there, there's there's push afoot, and maybe you know about that, but I don't. I do, and I appreciate that, uh, because DPSST was able to, normally July is there, let's go over the new curriculum, everybody gets a sabbatical. They heard our cries, both elected, and uh, the chiefs and sheriffs, they held a July, so we actually were able to move somebody, you know, a month early. This time, it's December is gonna be shut, so, uh, we weren't able to get ours all through the process to get the November Academy, so now the next one is February. So there's, there's a gap of December and January of no classes. Now whether or not that changes, which would be nice, understand possibly December would be a one to shut it down and get everything ready, but if there's a chance to push them for a January, that's, that's still gonna help. 30 days is 30 days, uh, so thank you. Uh, appreciate that. All right, other comments or questions? Uh, Councilor Newton? Yes, um, Chief, thanks for pointing out the good work of the CCU. I saw the news piece before I came to council. 
and um, having worked here, I think uh, it's really would be great for our community to have a really good understanding about the value of that unit. It's it's not not every department has a CCU, a commercial crimes unit, and uh, another um, example of why that's such a valuable program that we have in Tiger that not other uh, not every uh, every community has. So, good work. Yeah, thank you. And and I do know that was one of those sections in the community academy that was uh, piqued their interest and uh, they appreciated knowing a little bit more about them. So we'll make sure we, we continue to let the community know of their good work. Thank you. I think the way we fund it is unique too and Very. Worth, worth communicating. Uh, Councilor Goodhouse, any questions or comments? I was just going to ask, I know that we have the CCU, but what can businesses, if there's been more crimes with businesses with theft and so forth, what can businesses do or is that something to reach out and have the CCU come and talk to them or is it just what, what do they need to do to change their business if, if people are getting more blatant just coming in and stealing or causing problems? Sure. Um, first of all, yes, that, that is a uh, service that they provide and so contacting Sergeant Rivera and scheduling that, I would say any business owner can do that. Uh, some of the others, it was brought to my attention, uh, uh, interested community member happened to be at uh, a box store and noticed that most of the high-end items were now locked up so you couldn't feel them you couldn't touch them and they go is that a is that normal and I said well it's it's a preventative action because people are just taking and walking out the door um, so that's something that it's it's not the great customer experience that, that I think retailers would like to provide but it is a uh, great preventative just like they did years ago on the ephedrine when they were making uh, methamphetamine and they were just stealing them off the shelf they had to lock them up and it was a slight inconvenience but people got used to it so I think anything that uh, stores can do on a preventative uh, measure is helpful and uh, the CCU team can actually walk them through and point out a few things and that that would go for retail but also your 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 local stores that only have one store um, we, we service all of them you bet. Any other questions or comments? No, no I, I guess I just want to thank you and your team for National Night Out. It was a great opportunity to really get to spend some time with the community. Did you want to tell everyone about the drone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. The demonstration? <laughs> the demonstration? Yeah. Well, as I, as, I t as I told the department and I think in leadership team, I think my competitive spirit got the better of me. As you know, sometimes we are upstage by TVF and R and their shiny fire department rigs and everything else. And so I decided I was going to call in the drone and gathered all the kids. And I, I can tell you, all the adults were just as impressed with the drone. Um, I watched the fire department personnel looking too. Um, so, it, you know, and what was great is they, they understood all the. Um, different tools, it's not a big brother, it simply really is about officer safety, going out in our green spaces when somebody's missing, or you know, even assisting canine in their tracks. And so it was very well received. We hope to do more demonstrations, but thank you for asking. Yeah, no, it was a really cool demonstration to talk about the different ways and the different technologies that we're using to combat everything that's going on. So it, had, it was cool to see and it was very educational, so thank you for bringing you. it out. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. All right, we will move on to an update from the Tigard Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Community and Membership Engagement Manager Love. Good to see you in person. Yes, it's so exciting to be back in person. I was like, <laughs> oh, I haven't done this in so long. Um, so it's good to see you all. I'm Jessica Love, Community and Membership Engagement for the Tiger Chamber of Commerce. Our Leadership Tiger program is starting to recruit. Applications are open for our class of 2023. And the deadline is September 22nd to get applications in. And this is an opportunity for anyone that wants to learn about our community, really get a good in-depth overview of what Tigard has to offer in all of our different sectors. And for anybody that's interested in becoming a future community leader, this is a really good opportunity as a stepping stone to getting to that opportunity. The uh, class will start officially October 11th of 2022. So that's coming up. The uh, Tiger Chamber Board of Directors has finalized our strategic plan through 2025. And so I just wanted to touch base on a few areas that are really focusing on this year and over the next few years. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is a huge piece of that that we're going to be working on. I know our board is going through uh, 
training process as well and making sure that we're implementing it throughout our entire programming that we offer. Advocacy, political action, workforce development, and then also continuing our partnership and growing our partnership with the City of Tigard, the Tigard Downtown Alliance, and other like-minded organizations. We have our government affairs and public policy meeting coming up on August 18th, and then our candidate endorsement committee is currently doing their interview process right now, and we should be doing our announcements on who we plan to endorse in by the end of August um, or early September timeframe. Our visitor center is going to be under remodel over here uh, in the next month or so, and it's going to be transitioning to become the welcoming center. And um, we just want to thank everyone for participating in Tiger Restaurant Month in June. It was a huge success. We had a lot of great participation this year, and so hopefully we'll get to see that come back next year. And then we host networking every single Thursday at 7.30 in the morning still. We will be moving to 100% in person, so we will no longer be offering virtual, but we're looking at other opportunities, how we can add hybrid opportunities like tonight to our programming as well. And then for the farmer's market, we are open. We're still going strong. We had to cancel uh, two Sundays ago because of the heat. And then last Sunday, we just decided to stay uh, open for a shorter amount of time. So we encourage the community to be looking out on our social media to stay up to date on what our current hours are. Now that we're getting into the August time frame, it usually <laughs> gets a lot hotter. <laughs> uh, and for the safety of our vendors, it's hugely important since they're standing on concrete until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we have a Market Sprouts Kids Club program that's going to be launching. We have a grant from Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District, so stay tuned for that. Kids will actually get dollars to spend at the market for themselves and learn how to shop at the farmer's market. And we have new vendors joining us continually throughout the season, so please join us. And then for the Tiger Downtown Alliance, we have the Explore Downtown Tiger Street Fair and Multicultural Festival that is coming up on September 10th. Vendor spots are still available, and then we are also looking for volunteers to help with the function of the event of like watching barricades and running the bounce house and so on and so forth. So if anybody's interested, reach out to me. And then we have our downtown Tiger Mixer that's on August 17th at Tiger Tap House. This is open to everyone to come. Uh, it doesn't have to be just businesses within the downtown core. And then downtown Tiger is open. Please come support our businesses during the construction process now that we have two major pro uh, construction programs going on. So, any questions? Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. No? Any questions? Councilor Goodhouse? Yes. For the, uh, what changes are being made for the, you said the visitor center, there's going to be, so what, I mean, a lot of us go to a symposium, so what's going to be changed in there, or what's, is it the hallway or one of the rooms, or? Yeah, it's going to be the hallway. Um, and it's going to have all new <coughs> floors. It's going to be have a new paint of coat. We have new um, displays opportunities. And then also we have a digital screen that we now have access to utilize how we wish. And so we'll be implementing some kind of new programming on that as well. Okay. So thank it's just going to have a refreshed look. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Did you mention maybe you did farm the table coming up too? Did you do that one? We do have the farm to table going up. Um, the sales of the tickets haven't gone as well um, as we would hoped, and so we're currently processing on if we should need to cancel that event. Oh, okay. Um, so you have until Thursday evening to buy your tickets, uh, and we'll make the decision after that point. But Friday, August 26th. Okay. I didn't know if you mentioned that one or not. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll move on to follow up to previous citizen communication. Uh, Assistant City Manager Nyland for our first evening, remote Mr. presenter. I know. Welcome to my living room um, and welcome back to, to Town Hall. So, Mr. Mayor and Council, at our July 19th Council meeting, we did receive four written comments. One was about a personnel matter and three were about urban agriculture. There were no callers. All have received a response. The three constituents who commented about urban ag received an acknowledgement and have been added to our database so we can provide regular updates about that code policy discussion which falls under our home program so as you know it has been especially busy since we last last met as chief mentioned we had another successful national night out i think um at my neighborhood block party there were over a hundred attendees which was great and we also survived another heat 
wave. Thanks to all of those who worked to open up our cooling centers to provide relief to those in need. We are likely to reach the high 90s again next week. So that said, a fun fact that is really related to safety, water. It's all about water right now. Conserving water, when to use water, and most importantly, when to drink water. Dehydration is the absence of a sufficient amount of water in your body. The best way to beat dehydration is to drink before you get thirsty. If you're thirsty, you've already experienced mild dehydration, and that can cause symptoms like a headache, fatigue, dizziness, and more. So stay safe, stay, stay cool, and drink water, and apply sunscreen. That's my public health message for tonight. Thanks for listening. That's my report. Thank you, Assistant City Manager Nyland. And Mr. Nolup and IT team, uh, we could barely hear that, I would say, in the council chamber. So the next presenter that's gonna be online, we need to, I think, figure out how to get the audio to come through the speakers in the room. Is that, I, I'm not sure what was supposed to be happening, but I could barely hear that. Okay. Okay, we'll take a look, Mr. Mayor, and see if we can get it adjusted. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, written public comment. I don't believe we received any by the deadline today, City Recorder Craig. That's is that correct? correct. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to in person public comment. Do we have a sign up sheet? Do we, are we doing sign up sheets again? Yes. Anybody ready to sign up? No. Nobody signed up in person. All right. Mr. Nolup, do we have any phone in public comment? Uh, Mr. Mayor, currently we have two callers in the queue. I will pass the first one through. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Please state your name for the record and then try to keep your, te actually, not try. I need you to keep your testimony to three minutes, please. Uh, go ahead when you're ready. My name is Elizabeth Sprague. Our small Tigard homestead is in compliance with all city codes. It has been confirmed by the city as well as other professionals that our property does not smell, does not have an excessive amount of feces or debris, does not harbor or attract bugs or rodents, and does not cause excessive noise. Our animals have more than the recommended square footage per animal, are happy, healthy, and safe. But one unhappy neighbor who has harassed our family for nearly a decade is going door to door, calling into meetings, contacting local media, and spreading fear and false information is putting our homestead at risk, and the city is letting him do it. Public records from the city of Tigard show that there have only been seven complaints about poultry or livestock in the last six years. From 2021 until July 2022, there have only been three complaints regarding poultry or livestock. Two from Mr. Potoff. Tigard has over 21,000 households and two of them complained. Tigard had nearly 500 nuisance complaints in that time and just three of them are regarding poultry and livestock. But you are pushing to add restrictions and even rushing them. You are pushing to add regulations that could force my family, my children, to give up pets that they have rescued, bottle raised, and loved regulations that could make us and others like us choose which few to keep and which will be killed. Because make no mistake, poultry and livestock are not easily rehomed into pet homes. They're killed and eaten. Mayor Snyder, you said when talking about our home that this is not a nine-year-old with a couple chickens, and you're right. This is a community that feeds each other, that cares for each other, that works together to create a better future for our children. This is you and the council choosing to admit there is no reason to fix what isn't broken, or you and the council potentially sending the pets of a seven-year-old autistic boy, an eight-year-old boy, a 14-year-old boy, a 16-year-old boy, and so many others to their deaths because you decided to change the rules. Because six out of over 21,000 households have complained about poultry or livestock in the last six years because complaints against poultry, poultry and livestock are less than one half of 1% of the total nuisance complaints for Tiger since 2021. Poultry and livestock are not the issue here. We need you to step up and do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sprague. Mr. Nolop, please put the next caller through.
Yes, this is Mike Sprague. Hi. We've been trying to focus on building community by... Hi. We've been trying to focus on building community by being the change we want to see and helping other neighbors get the property into compliance because they are not physically or financially able to do it themselves. Our ghosts have helped clear debris from multiple overgrown properties this year alone. My wife, teens, and I worked through the longest heat wave Oregon has seen since 1941 while we were all sick with COVID, while helping my father, also sick with COVID, recover from spinal surgery, while helping my mother, also sick with COVID, recover from a broken foot. Our two younger children also had COVID. We dealt with our foster animals and our pets at the same time. We worked to fill dumpsters or 30-yard drop boxes uh, provided by the city to one of our elderly disabled, neighbor, disabled neighbors so that they would be filled when the city wanted them picked up. Not our property, not our responsibility, but a promise we made to our community and an example of our commitment and of the kindness we want to see spread. While we've been working to build community and save our animals, our neighbor has been busy raising his voice to my wife and city staff during the public meeting at the library, intimidating our family on our property, threatening my wife with litigation for using kindness as a weapon, trespassing with his dinner guests onto the neighboring property he has been told not to set foot on, and complaining to the city about our shed that is, per compliance officer Ken Roth, in compliance with city code. Even though the shed is within code, my family has been working this week to better organize the contents so that it might not bother our neighbor less. Why? Because the city asks nicely and kindness matters. Actions matter. How we treat others matter. My family has spent over 500 hours this year defending ourselves from the slander and misinformation spread by our neighbor, the local paper, and these city council meetings. People claiming we have geese when we have no, never owned a goose, saying nobody wants roosters when although we don't keep roosters, we don't want them restricted either. There are several roosters in Tigard that nobody complains about, so the city has no idea they're here. They just assume nobody wants them. Showing photos of rats caught on our property and claiming they're from others. People claiming manure from our animals is going into the water system, when in fact the USDA wants people to use animal manure instead of chemical fertilizers because the chemical fertilizers are what are ending up in our water stream or water system. Some misinformation may seem small, but even the small bits can snowball and do plenty of damage. I listened to the last city council meeting in which you didn't allow people to call in for, because we had eight ready to call, say that they do not want geese in these flocks. Why? Do they have any information, concrete information, saying that the goose should not be in there, other than misinformation and urban legends? They don't actually hurt or kill or maim people. We need you to educate yourselves if you're going to be voting on something that is such a huge, important part of our lives. We need you to be able to admit when you're wrong and do better. We need you to stand behind the community's voice and not one really squeaky wheel. We don't need you, Mr. Snyder, Mayor Snyder, pulling up in front of our neighbor's house and then driving by our house and taking a few pictures and being shocked at what he sees. You, you mentioned it in the March city council meeting. I don't know the time stamp. If I need to, I'll find it. But that kind of information that gets published turns up and we get to hear it from other people. That is slandering our family's name and what we are doing here. You are a responsible, important part of the community who should not be making comments like this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. All right, Mr. Nolop, are there Mr. any Mayor, other? Really quickly, was yeah. that, who, what was the name of that caller? I think that was Mike Sprague. Okay, thank you. Is, Mr. Nolop, is there another caller in the queue? Uh, there is, Mr. Mayor, I'll pass it through now. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Schiffer, and uh, I don't have any chickens yet, but I do have a front yard in agriculture. <laughs> Hey, sorry, kiddo, I'm, uh, I'm talking to city council. Uh, and I just wanted to call in support of uh, Elizabeth and Michael. And, um, you know, I ride my bicycle with my kid, who's trying their hardest to interrupt me right now. <laughs> but uh, I, I ride past their home on my bicycle with my kid to Summer Lake Park. And it's just my kid lights up. It's amazing to see them. And I hope to have chickens someday myself. And it's not just Elizabeth and Mike, but it's also 
uh, I don't know the neighbors yet, but they have a wonderful little vineyard up on Fano Creek Trail, north of uh, uh, North Dakota. <laughs> and uh, I, I, it's a beautiful yard. They've got a lot of uh, apples and grapes, and uh, they also have more than four chickens. Uh, and you know, I, I just got to say, um, what would make sense to me, because we maybe should have regulation, but it shouldn't be based off of Portland's. We should maybe go the extra mile and think a little bit about what good conditions are. Uh, you know, is it for a chicken? Do we need two to five square feet of space for each chicken for goats? Is it 200 square feet? That's the kind of approach we should be doing it, and not something that's based off of just what our neighbors are saying is right or wrong. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Uh, thanks a lot for giving time and listening to me ramble. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Nullup, are there any other callers in the queue? Uh, Mr. Mayor, that is all the callers in the queue. All right, we'll move on to video public comment, the first time we've tried this. Mr. Nolop, is there anyone wishing to testify by video? Uh, Mr. Mayor, no one is, uh, had signed up to testify by video, but I'm going to do a quick test of the system if you're okay with that. Sure. And uh, mm -hmm. Hello, Council. Can you... Okay, that's what we needed to hear. So uh, I appreciate the test and we can move on. That is all That is all for the uh, video public comments. All right, you were looking for feedback. Okay, you got it, <laughs> literally. All right, we'll move on to the consent agenda, local contract review board. Consent agenda is used for routine items, including minutes and approval of contracts or intergovernmental agreements. Information on each item is available on the city's website. In the packet for this meeting, these items may be enacted in one motion without separate discussion. Council members may request that an item be removed by motion for discussion and separate action. On the consent agenda tonight, we have Tiger Street Bridge Replacement, Kruger Creek Stabilization, Dirksen Nature Park, Tiger Street Community Trail, and then Greenberg Road, Tiedemann Avenue Study. Uh, I think if we do have questions about any of these, the staff will be testifying virtually i think um so is there a motion or any th any questions that the council wants to ask council president Lou? i move to approve the consent agenda as presented I'll second okay it's been moved and seconded any further discussion uh city recorder roll call vote please councillor goodhouse yes councillor newton yes Council President Lube? Yes. Councilor Shaw? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay, consent agenda is passed unanimously. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to item number five in the agenda, which is a Public Safety Advisory Board final report. Chief McAlpine, you're going to introduce your guests, members of the Public Safety Advisory Board, leaders from the Public Safety Advisory Board. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Again, Chief Kathy McAlpine. Um, I'm here to have the distinct honor of introducing our Public Safety Advisory Board Chair for this last quarter, uh, Patty Lofgren and Vice Chair Jeff Mott. I'd also like to draw attention to the fact that we do have uh, some of our other PSAB members in the audience and also tuning in virtually. Uh, Commander McDonald from the Police Department, Valerie Sasaki, Judge Michael O'Brien, and Jimmy Brown are in attendance as well. And who knows, it's given the opportunity, they, they may also speak or provide input, you never know. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Locker, please. Thank you, Chief McAlpine. <clears throat> um, could we go to the next slide, please? Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I am Patty Lofker and I have been the chair of the Public Safety Advisory Board since March. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to spend some time reviewing what has happened since you last had a presentation. And then um, we are going to, um, have you received the 
document, yes, this beautiful document that you all put together here at the city, um, which uh, encapsulates everything that's happened in the 36 meetings, 72 hours of public safety advisory board meetings that we've had in the last 18 months. Um, and then we'll go on to talk about some of the highlights that members found um, participating in the public safety advisory board. And then we'll have time at the end for any questions that you have for us. All right. Um, next um, slide. Oh, there. I am the chair. Jeff has been the vice chair. Um, so as you probably know, the um, mission of the advisory board was to improve the lived experience of all people in Tigard so that everyone enjoys the same safety and privilege through comprehensive review of the practices and procedures in the city police department, the municipal court, and the social justice initiatives. Um, next slide. So the values of the board, as you can see here, are centering the conversation around those most impacted, um, listening to each other, which um, I, was, I was just really impressed with how well that worked for all of us. Um, learning, so we had presentations each week and then um, time for discussion. Um, then we would focus on the particular outcomes that we wanted to see for Tigard and trying to come each time to consensus on our recommendations, which almost always happened, not always, um, and then sharing our work um, with the Tigard community. So next slide, please. So in April, we had um, a presentation on the Community Academy and Traffic Stop Follow-Up Policy. Um, we had a lovely uh, several meetings with Judges O'Brien and Oberdorfer, bringing us up to speed um, in terms of uh, the judicial topics. Um, the community service, we discussed having community service as an alternative to traffic fines, and um, um, that's still in process. Um, and then in May, um, we had uh, very thorough presentations on the mental health response teams and our recommendations there, um, and then discuss the community navigator position. Um, that one we discussed for quite a while. And then in June, um, we had the community academy recap and department recertification presentations, and um, then eventually police and community relationship building, next steps and discussions um, about where to go next after PSAB. And then finally, um, we reviewed and reflected on the Public Safety Advisory Board. Um, I do have to say that each time I was very impressed with the presenters, each time we had someone very um, informed and, and ready to talk and, to us about their topic and very willing to answer questions. So that was, I learned a great deal in those sessions. Even though I've, I've lived here for 30 years, I, there was so much I didn't know that I learned through those presentations. Um, okay, so next slide. This is just kind of an overview of who the Public Safety Advisory Board members were. Um, as you know, Chief McAlpine and Commander McDonald were on the PSAB. Um, Nicholas Nunn, who's the president of the Tiger Police Officers Association, was on the um, board, and um, Councilor Newton was on the board, and uh, City Attorney Rahala, and um, former Youth City Councilor Emilio Calderon, um, and the former president of the Tiger High School Black Student Union, Abdi Mohammed, um, and then uh, Elise Butera, who's the former Tiger High School Study Body student body president and black student union president. We had John T Trin, the mental health professional. And then the community representatives were Jimmy Brown, John Gearhart, Lee Landers, myself, Justin Lowe, Danny Rauda, Valerie Sasaki, Sean Stuhldreyer, Nick Jarmer, Jeff Mott, and Shahrazad Leyland. All right, I'm gonna pass this up to you, Jeff, and next. Yeah, next slide, please. So what you see on the screen is just a high-level overview of the calendar um, from when we started the process. Mayor Snyder started the process in June of 2020 following the murder of George Floyd and the surge in the community 
uh, for social justice and racial justice. There are over 500 community comments that came into the city around um, public safety and police community relations. So the mayor requested that the council approve the creation of a board for community uh, for police oversight from the community. So in, that happened. Um, the approval happened in September of 2020. Uh, board members were selected in November after a rigorous application process that was uh, fun and embarrassing for me a little bit. Um, we started official work in December, uh, we spent the next three months working, uh, finalizing the work plan, deciding topics, and the schedule of the flow. And then the smallest part on this page was the longest time period from March 2021 to just this last June, 15 months going, working through the plan, um, the topics, and making recommendations. And we just concluded with the party in Cook Park in June 2020. Next slide, please. This is the full list of high-level topics. There were subtopics and subtopics beneath that for each of, each of these uh, you see on the screen. But the overall plan for the board was to bring in presenters, um, bring in experts from the department or uh, the community to educate the board first before we went through to make recommendations. So we, we were educated, we learned, we shared our personal experiences, our personal viewpoints, discussed everything together before making recommendations. Um, and for a more detailed review, you can look in the appendix in the report that you have a copy of. Next slide. Just gonna some quick hit numbers real quick. Uh, 15 board members, uh, four pairs of board chairs and vice chairs that um, along with our consultancy firm ran the meetings um, and were the liaisons to you, the city council. Uh, over 10 guest presenters and con instructors, 72 hours of uh, two hour Monday evening meetings. Uh, next slide over 40 work plan topics covered in five uh, major units. Nine of us participated in laser shot uh, scenario training at uh, just over here across the parking lot. We passed eight recommendations and this is our fifth report to the city council um, and hopefully the work affects thousands in the community. Next slide. Thank you. So we held um, our meetings, all of our meetings over Zoom um, and um, due to the pandemic. And uh, I, I still think they were inc incredibly rich. I think um, the, the platform allowed the presentations to be very clear and um, easy to follow. And then uh, oftentimes we were in breakout rooms discussing different things and coming back together and sharing our conversations with the whole group um, prior to each evening coming to some sort of consensus about whatever it was that we were being asked to reflect on. Um, as Jeff mentioned, 72 hours over 18 months. We met every second and fourth Monday of the month. And, uh, and I think the, it was, in terms of the Zoom meetings I've been in in the last 18 months, I think these were the most informative and powerful and uh, I, I actually looked forward to them every month every second and fourth Monday which surprised me in terms of zoom meetings <laughs> um, next slide so this is these are the eight recommendations that we made um, to the city and to the police department um, as you can see five of them have been um, implemented um, two of them, um, three are fully implemented and two of them are implemented and ongoing. So the first recommendation we made was to have every single police officer have a body-worn camera and that has, and, and dash camera, and that was implemented, which that really surprised me, that happened so fast. Um, and then the cross-cultural communications training was implemented and that is ongoing. Um, hands-on force and force-on-force force training, um, four hours um, just to improve that, give them ongoing um, training in that, and that's continuing. 
um, eva we evaluated the emergency communication policy that has been implemented. Um, we recommended uh, establishing a professional standards sergeant. That has happened. Um, and then things that are still ongoing, exploring, we had a hard time, everybody had a hard time um, saying the word ombudsman. So, so it was, it, it was a community-centered, citywide role person. But um, anyway, that was, that was a kind of a funny evening. Um, and then um, we recommended having the possibility of community service versus having traffic fines as an alternative to traffic fines. And that's still being explored. And then um, I, I thought the mental health response team presentations were extraordinarily um, powerful. And, and I'm quite impressed with what's going on right now. But there's still an ongoing um, um, countywide discussion that's taking place based on that. And so, um, and also the community navigator position, the ombudsman, that is, um, is uh, in the budget for fiscal year tw uh, 2024. So that's where that is, um, is going to, that that's why it's ongoing at that point. Uh, I think next slide. So we all took a survey um, at the end of our sessions. Patty's gonna take you through a little bit of the results later, but according to the board members, these three recommendations were the most impactful. Um, mental health first response team, recommendation was geared toward augmenting the already great work the existing mental health response team that's shared um, across Tri-Cities to provide a more street level uh, response for interactions with no risk, no risk of violence. Um, think about uh, what large and medium cities across the country have Im implemented through street, street response teams or cahoots in Eugene. Um, the goal, the goal and some of the benefits of this program would be to better provide service by uh, experts in the field that can help people experience mental health crisis. We, it also potentially save the city a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and yes, I forgot the last one. Anyway, um, the second most impactful uh, recommendation was around providing body cameras for the for the uh, department force wide. Um, that was seemed like it was going to go through from the start. Everyone seemed to be on board. A lot of the negotiation revolved around the policies and um, the internal policies around uh, when to use, what to record, if it can be doctored or not, um, release that that kind of thing. And and through work with several members on the team and Commander McDonald, um, we were able to come to a really nice spot that, that improved accountability, transparency, and equity through those, through those updates to the policy. The third, cross-cultural communications training um, is ongoing and implemented. It's based around providing training to the police department so they have an equity lens. And um, in their interactions, no matter who or what kind of person they're interacting with in the public. Um, so better service, better responses, and uh, better outcomes through interactions. Next slide. Some other ways the board members advanced the conversation. We all had homework to read, so you want to talk about race. Uh, before any of the meetings started, we, we spent a meeting um, talking about takeaways from the book. Um, Several of us participated in uh, the officer interview board here in this room. Um, we engaged with various community organizations. Uh, Jimmy and the chief were on OPB's Think Out Loud, uh, thanks to a little nudge from Patty and her friends over at OPB. Um, and John Tran interviewed for Talking Tiger and learning from our differences. Next slide. Um, so we'll just take you through some photos uh, over the last, you know, 15, 18 months to, before we close out the presentation and get to questions. But this is from uh, the Pride Parade in 2021 with uh, Chief McAlpine and, and other officers. Next slide. And so other um, opportunities that we had to participate in the community, um, Jimmy Brown and I were able to come here and 
be uh, participants in the chat with the chief, um, which was a, quite a, a lovely evening. Um, and then John um, Trin uh, was on Late Night in Tigard with uh, Mayor Snyder. And then uh, many of us on an ongoing basis have been volunteering at the Tigard Farmers Market at the Tigard table um, and, and are there to talk about the Public Safety Advisory Board. And I always copied handouts of you know what the, what the purpose of the board was to hand out to people. Um, and they were always pretty interested in hearing about it. And, and I think that was a nice way to communicate with the community about our work. Um, next slide. This was quite an interesting experience. Um, we were asked um, to sign up for the laser shot training. And I had no idea what it was. <laughs> and I had no idea it would take as long as it took or be as extraordinarily thorough as it was or as scary <laughs> but it was it was a very educational experience in every respect both physically and mentally and in terms of um, the sort of training that the police officers have to go through I I think we all, all those I, and I mean I, I thought it would take 20 minutes and I was there for over an hour so it was quite thorough um, training and very well done um, so that was a fun experience. Next slide. Um, and then we um, recommended that the Community Academy be resurrected, and that was sort of like um, a, a compilation of the Public Safety Advisory Board just taking everybody through everything that was going on in the community. The only sad thing about it was they wouldn't let us come. <laughs> And because uh, I would have I gone through it again, I just, I have so enjoyed learning more about my community and being engaged and involved. So if they do it again, maybe they'll let us come. But, um, but the, the very, very positive um, um, rating by the folks who are participated in it this year. So I think that was very well done. Um, next slide. So this is, an, in terms of, um, Barney and Worth did a, a survey in terms of each PSAB member in terms of what their experience was on the board. And 100% believe the police department engaged in constructive and helpful conversation. 83% felt proud of the work that PSAB accomplished. 84% believe they received the education and resources to be an effective board member. And 92% um, thought that the Public Safety Advisory Board um, Delivered positive results to the community. So, next slide. And finally, we'll just go through some of the comments from the survey from um, from board members, and, and I'll I'll read a few. Um, I think the discussions we had around social justice and equity were incredibly impactful. The George Floyd murder resonated in our meetings to the point that his death was not described as a death, but as a murder that takes its strong position on the role that law enforcement played in his murder. Not an easy, easy thing to say. Um, and, and Patty talked about it at the beginning of the presentation. Before every meeting, we all did a little, uh, I guess, meditation or guided, guided talk where we focused on why we were here. And this comment kind of, I think, stems from those centering exercises at the beginning of each meeting. Um, another one, it was life changing for me. I will forever add the equity lens to my decision making. You can't assume an individual's perspective. And I was pleasantly surprised to see how open to change the city police department was on many topics. Next slide. I appreciate our board colleagues. Everyone was very respectful and very thoughtful in, our, in their communications. Thank you to our city staff and the chief for their willingness to listen and be open to our recommendations. And finally, it has been an honor and an ed education. Next slide. And the final slide before we open it up for discussion. Um, this was our little gathering at Cook Park Pizza Party. Um, it was awesome to meet many of the members of the board um, in person for the first time, you know, after spending almost two years staring at each other at a, on a computer screen. Um, so it was a blast um, and overall super enriching. And uh, I think the outcome of the board will create a concrete and positive impact for the community. So thank you, Chief, 
um, and the rest of the department uh, for the time, for the willingness to engage and improve and, um, and thank you in advance for your continued work toward accountability, transparency, and equity to help the citizens of Tiger. And I, I, I do, I highly, I, this is just, they did such a beautiful job of capturing um, the big points of our work and going into depth. It's, I, it's excellent, very excellent. I highly recommend you take some time with it. And the other thing that I think we didn't mention is based on this, I think the chief is going to have an ongoing um, advisory group here in the city of Tiger. Well, yes, it is, Patty. No. <laughs> yes, uh, one of the last uh, requests that I had of the Public Safety Advisory Board, that, you know, it was no secret that I had been thinking about a chief's advisory panel for some time, almost, you know, within a year that I got here. And things started happening, and that at that time was not the priority because I wanted to get to know the community before I asked them to come have a seat at the table. Uh, but this was just a great timing is to not lose momentum is to continue uh, having this, but uh, not maybe at the heavy lift that everybody's had to do. So uh, I sought uh, their, just their suggestions on frequency, the makeup of the advisory board, so they could see themselves. There are a few that even volunteered to still continue this work, uh, as well as some of our community academy members were interested in possibly being on that advisory panel. Um, so yeah, that, I just took about a 30-day 30, 30 break and wanted to just, then start focusing that, but not wait too long before um, the good work of the, uh, the advisory board had just done. Questions for us at this point? Well, I just want to thank all of you. I, I thanked you at the, at the event at Cook Park. I think individually, each of you. Um, and just from the bottom of my heart, the amount of time, effort, energy that all of you, and I'm going to look at even Councilor Newton, put into this effort was tremendous and just on a personal level i want to thank you for that for the impact that it has to our entire community and chief mcalpine and to the leaders in the police department and the members of the police department that participated you know this took a lot of courage and a lot of thoughtfulness and i think some uh, amount of humility uh, and and willingness to engage that i'm not sure a lot of police departments in the in the greater region would have done and so I appreciate you going through this with our community on this journey um, so thank you others have questions or comments Councillor Shaw yeah, I just want to commend the Public Safety Advisory Board this was an excellent summary and some very good recommendations um, in particular I was honored to be a part of the Community Academy along with uh, Councillor Goodhouse and just to see firsthand uh, what the police were doing with the um, replacement of the old technology for body cameras and just expansion of that technology. We had the opportunity to wear the vests and actually do a mock with those body cams. I can tell you the recollection you have compared to what the camera actually shows is so different and so important. Um, so I too want to commend the police for enabling us to have the community academy and also to be able to participate, but also for each year hard work and I look forward to getting further recommendations established and the ongoing advisory committee too. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Council President Luke, anything? I, I don't have anything to add other than it's just been incredible to watch and to learn and to bring the community along with you. So thank you for that. Councilor Goodhouse. Just the same. Thank you for all the hard work and the hours of you know, time putting in and the thoughtful discussions on everything. It means a lot to the community to see that we work together as a community, that an issue can be brought forward, but then everyone works on together on it. I think that's what I heard a lot was that people were surprised about how everyone kind of worked on everything, looked at things from different perspectives, and that's what makes a, a difference, and that's why we have a great community and a great police force and, and great citizens. So uh, the continued works can be great to see that we have that open lines of communications both ways. Councilor Newton, you want to say anything? Well, everybody knows how I feel about it. I always talk about how life-changing it was, and I, as I'm listening to the report tonight, I was reminded of how thoughtful the discussions were. I mean, we would have presentations, people got information, and really committed to having discussions and really working through 
listening to everybody, taking in everybody's perspectives and to come up with the best recommendations we could. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that. And I think I've talked to other cities about what a great model this is as a way to have discussions about difficult community topics um, because I think it worked really well. I'm gonna miss everybody um, and seeing your faces on Zoom <laughs> every um, twice a month, but it was a really great experience and really made me think differently as a counselor about how I make decisions um, and, and trying to think more, more with an equity lens and, and really think about how the decisions we make affect people. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing these recommendations all implemented. And again, really quickly, the, the department, the police department was amazing. They were very um, you know, open to listening and being honest about what they thought might not work. <laughs> so um, yeah, anyway, I appreciated the experience. And thanks to my colleagues for letting me um, represent you on the board. And Mayor, may I add one comment? Sure. Um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you electeds, it's a thankless job. And early on, you had a vision of what this might look like. may not have had it all w well dialed, but you saw what was happening across this country. And while it might not have been happening in Tigard at that moment, you had a vision of wanting to have our community look at their own police department, the good, the bad, and the ugly, how we could change. And I just, you know, like we said, may not want to sign up for this and say, yeah, please, you know. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it was enlightening. But I just want to thank you. I mean, you know, you, you, you had the vision. You um, put the money behind it. You put the time. And I, I just uh, uh, appreciate what uh, you as a, a council was able to accomplish as well. So thank you. Youth Councilor Naga, I didn't call on you. Do you want to share anything as well? Yeah. Um, just wanted to say you guys did a great job um, I took a social justice leadership class a couple uh, last year and we actually talked about uh, police brutality and race and I was so glad I could brag about how great job of um, a job our city is doing and I really appreciate the youth advocacy in this um, I know that students have a lot of thoughts and oftentimes adults don't really care about what students have to say but I'm so glad that you know we were given a seat at the table and taken seriously. So I would just like to thank you so much for everything. Well, have thank one. you. Are there other, sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Oh, I just have one question. Everyone in the room uh, up here has the report with them. Is this or will it be available on the Tiger website for public consumption? I'm certain it will be, it may already be. Yes, it is. And then we also have a hard copy in the police lobby. So again, when they're waiting uh, and they're tired of looking at the strategic plan, they can <laughs> read the good work of the Public Safety Advisory Board. Are there other members of the Public Safety Advisory Board who are present who would like to say anything? I want to, you know, this is an important part of closure, I think. Is there, Mr. Brown, anything? Yeah. Come in. <laughs> When you ask him to speak, he usually speaks. We'll see. Do come up and use the microphone, though, and turn, turn it so it turns green. <laughs> oh, Chief. Well, good evening. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I could say uh, about the, the PSAB and we don't have a lot of time to do that, so I'll try and bring it to just a couple of things. One, I want to thank City Council um, for the heavy lifting that you all did to get us to this point. Um, PSAB was born of a horrible time in our country. The murder of black men by police officers across the country caused municipal governments everywhere to examine their role in the behaviors that caused the death of people in their community. But what Tigard showed is that instead of being behind the curve, in the curve, you went in front of the curve. And that to me is 
one of the defining reasons why I enjoy being a member of the Tiger community. Um, my history with Tiger Police Department has had its moments, um, but I can say that where I see the Tiger Police Department and the city of, of Tiger going uh, from 28 years ago when I moved into Tiger uh, to now, and where I believe it is headed um, gives me great joy. At the neighbor's night out in our neighborhood this past week, um, I had the pleasure of meeting four families that had moved into Tigard from out of state. And they were impressed with what they had seen. They felt that this was the place that they had been looking to live their entire lives. I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing to say. Yes, they were from California, but <laughs> that's okay. That is okay because they, they brought with them the desire to be in a community that was growing, that was open, that was caring, and that had values that they could uh, connect with. And that's what you as the council uh, really, I think, brought forward with Peace Ave. And then I would like to thank all of the PSAB members because we really weren't sure where we were going with this initially. Uh, again, as it was born of something that had a very tough situation in our, in our community, we weren't sure where we were going. But I think all of us, along with our, our consultants, really worked toward uh, maintaining appropriate organizational and communication values that got us to this point. And um, you know, I'm just proud to have been uh, a member of PSAP. And with that, I'll close my, but I know Valerie had some words that she wanted to say. Oh, there, I, I'm, Mr. Brown, I'm gonna call on everybody, actually, so you, Ms. Saki, do you wanna, do you wanna speak? I, Okay, we'll do a, we'll do something in between. Commander McDonald, you want to? You don't have to. I mean, this is just an option. I, I'm not like forcing you. This isn't court. Judge, you want to say anything? Okay. Valerie, you want to speak now? No. Oh. Okay, did I miss anyone else as a member of the? I, I just have one last thing to say. When you, Mayor Snyder, when you thanked us, this is one of those experiences that gave back more energy than it took. It really, it, it, I just felt inspired and gratified and rewarded after every session. So, yeah, you don't have to thank me. I have to thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Mayor, did you want, do you want to see if anyone online wants to uh, uh, start? Uh, yeah, we can. I don't see anyone raising their hand. Are there any members of the Public Safety Advisory Board that are online that would like to speak? If you raise your hand electronically or just start speaking. I don't see any. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. We have to let the hugging happen. This is <laughs> this is probably a first at the end of a a city council presentation. A lot of Note, city recorder, a lot of hugging occurred. Oh, boy. In the middle of a meeting. Fascinating. All right, we're going to move on to item number six on the agenda, which is a city council goals update. And uh, management analyst Hendricks, you are online, it looks like? or I am, yes. Okay. And then we're also going to have Assistant City Manager Nyland remotely. 
and then the chief and assistant city manager Trich are in person. Yeah, we have a mix a mix tonight for this presentation. Okay, this is fascinating. <laughs> this will be a first. Let's go. See how it goes. All right. So uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Nicole Hendricks, and I'm the Senior Management Analyst in the City Manager's Office here at Tigard. Uh, we do have a team here tonight to present both virtually and in person to give you um, a fourth update, a progress report on your four council goals, um, which are to respond to houselessness, uh, COVID-19, um, and also develop and implement a community resiliency plan as well as our parks and recreation system plan. So as we implement these goals, um, we are keeping our, our five E's in mind, equity, environment, economy, engagement, and excellence. Um, we also refer to this as the community promise. Um, and we're keep keeping that as at the forefront of our, our decision making. So um, our update is gonna be a little bit more abbreviated this time to accommodate just for time. And so we intend to provide a more in-depth uh, quarterly report in October. So um, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Assistant City Manager Kathy Nyland, who's virtual, and our Police Chief Kathy McAlpine, who's in person for our Goal 1 update. The Kathy Show. So good evening again. My name is Kathy Nyland, and as mentioned, I'm the Assistant City Manager, and I am also um, the project sponsor um, for goal one, and that is, as we may recall, to implement an actionable, person-centric regional response to homelessness. So we have a lot to cover, but we know time is of the essence. So there are two pieces that we really want to highlight as far as accomplishments since our last update. Um, council was um, kind enough to approve ARPA funds that allowed us to build out this team and provide additional capacity. So we had a very successful recruiting process and we brought on Sarah Cooper um, to serve as our program coordinator. Sarah began um, her first day with Tigard was on July 25th, so just two weeks ago, and she's already made an impact and um, has quickly caught on to what we've done and where we want to go. So that said, Sarah, if you're online, I'd love you to turn on your camera and provide a couple words as we welcome you to your council meeting and your update. Good evening. Um, I'm delighted to be here. As Kathy said, my name is Sarah Cooper and I'm the new one, uh, new goal one program coordinator uh, in the city management office. The team has been absolutely amazing. Um, they've given me all the tools and information I need to hit the ground running on this critical issue. Uh, my door is always open. Um, for anyone who has questions or concerns or just wants to talk. Um, glad to be here. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Sarah. So some of the work that Sarah will be doing is she'll be convening the internal team, taking that over um, from Halstead Bernard and Chief. She'll also be working to um, convene the chart, which is our external um, think tank to work on this issue. She'll be continue to build relationships with our partners, including Washington County. So we are thrilled to have Sarah join our team and continue to make progress on this very important goal. And the other highlight, I will pass it off to Chief McAlpine to talk about our other big accomplishment that we um, navigated this last quarter. Chief. Thank you, Kathy. And again, Police Chief Kathy McAlpine, co-lead along with Library Director Halstead Bernard. Um, to kind of keep the momentum going and go very quickly, uh, the nice thing about the coordinator is first and foremost, um, Halstead and I can do our day jobs because this really does take a full-time effort. Uh, when you have the Metro Bond, you have Washington County's effort, what we're doing, what a lot of the service providers, you really need somebody to stay on top of this, connect the dots, see where there's overages, see where there's gaps, and, and be able to, um, advocate for the best interest of the city of Tigard and our uh, unhoused residents and as long as with our community. So very excited to have Sarah kind of get acclimated. Um, also want to draw your attention to, uh, this last time, as you're well aware of, uh, we did partner with Washington County on our largest uh, encampment, the Brownfields Encampment Cleanup. Um, we're not gonna go into it tonight. We're actually going to ask to be on agenda uh, in the future because there's one there's a lot of slides I think that we you need to hear from the people that were there doing the work 
um, the effort, the, the size of it, um, the challenges that, uh, you know, CSO Peterson and the police department have in just staying on top of it and people are coming back. So it's, it's a heavy lift that it deserves its own time. So we'll give you a lot more detail to include costs, the actual volume of uh, garbage that was taken out of there and, and so forth. Um, also during this time, we did apply for uh, federal funding for an additional community service officer to focus on encampments. And uh, I've been advised uh, by Nicole that we have made the first round approvals, which is something we haven't done in the past on other issues, so that's very exciting. But possibly won't hear anything final till maybe the end of the year. Um, and then uh, part of our internal team that we had, uh, and that includes CSO Peterson, Ken Ross, our code enforcement, and Erica from Just Compassion, did take a tour of Portland's safe rest village in Multnomah Village at the Sears Armory. Uh, they were very impressed with it. Uh, this is just one of six that they do that's uh, about 30 different pallet shelters. And um, we're looking again to see if that's something that we need to bring to Tigard. Um, and so I, I expect the internal team along with CHART will start looking at uh, uh, some of these other uh, services that we might be able to, to bring here. Uh, but they, again, I think I shared the, the photos that they took and got a visual on what that might look like. And lastly, um, uh, City Manager Reimer, myself, we, we were able to meet with City Manager's meeting to discuss, as Washington County, where shelters, the local ordinances, resources needed to address homelessness as a county and a region so that we are not pushing and pulling against each other. But one of the most important ones we're going to tackle first is time, place, and manner ordinance, how we interpreted that, um, how can we you know, implement it, and so again, that we're somewhat uh, aligned uh, as a county. So I look forward to those discussions and then obviously having Sarah um, get into those meetings as well. So we had to pause a little bit to get Sarah up and going. We've asked her to look at processes. Um, that's one of the things that um, city staff have been asking of us is what are our processes? We now have funding, so we hope to, to create uh, a system now in place and come back to all of you later with more details. And that is it for goal number one. Thank you. Thanks, Chief, and thanks, Assistant City Manager Nyland. <laughs> um, so for Council Goal 2, our HR Director, Dana Bennett, um, was co-lead on this with me, and since then she's retired. So I'll provide the update um, for our um, COVID-19 response, um, and our, our goal is to support the community through a coordinated COVID-19 response. So the strategies in that include um, allocating our American Rescue Plan funds, uh, addressing the digital divide, and embracing forward-thinking approaches for delivery of our services. Uh, since our last update in April, as it relates to American Rescue Plan, also known as ARPA, um, we have brought forward two investments in, and that includes um, a Tigered Frontline Employee Recognition Award, which you will receive uh, a more in-depth update at your next council meeting, I believe. And then as you just heard um, in the prior goal update, we had ARPA funds used to bring on Sarah, our new houselessness coordinator. So. Um, and, and actually also the encampment clean, cleanup as well. So we've been busy with uh, uh, allocating our ARPA funds and we're continuing to think of, of ways to invest and keeping that direct support in mind. So um, as for COVID communications and practices, city buildings are open to the public and we do have signage encouraging social distancing and the use of masks along with sanitation uh, supplies available. So. Um, along with that, we are watching uh, county COVID guidance and communicating those changes as well. Um, more recently, I don't have it on here because this just happened last week, but we've um, updated our approach so that our vaccine mandate for staff has been suspended. And that decision is going to be reviewed um, on a kind of quarterly basis beginning in um, December. So uh, lastly, I guess I'll just say we're navigating hybrid meetings. <laughs> so as you mentioned, this is our first hybrid meeting. I think this specific presentation is the first time we've kind of mixed the in-person and, and virtual. So 
we are learning, we're testing, and um, we're hoping to provide flexibility and embrace that forward-thinking approach that we've kind of outlined as a strategy for this goal. So thanks to everyone for the flexibility and patience um, and to our IT team for making this possible. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to uh, Assistant City Manager Emily Tritch for our Goal 3 update. Good evening, counselors. Uh, my name is Emily Tritch. I'm the Assistant City Manager for Infrastructure and Investment, and I'm really pleased to be with you uh, in person in Town Hall. Um, it's great to see your faces uh, in this way. Um, before I get started on the update around our Goal 3, our Community and Climate Resiliency effort, I wanted to acknowledge uh, this week as being a great moment, uh, hopefully, for uh, climate in uh, the United States. On Sunday, with the Senate passing the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which includes 370 or approximately 370 billion dollars of funds to energy and climate programs and so this would be the biggest clean energy investment uh, from federal funds in america's history and uh, stay tuned for what happens at the house but i think this really speaks to a moment uh, in in our country for getting attention on uh, clean energy, uh, the long-term impacts of climate, and, and these sorts of considerations. So responding to that moment, being ahead of the curve, as, as uh, we've heard uh, about this council in the past, we are responding to a council goal around climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, so our community resiliency plan includes several strategies that you see on the screen before you, including developing a plan specific to Tigard. Uh, we've been working with our consulting uh, firm on this and intend to present recommendations uh, uh, specific to uh, Tigard's experience with a, a low carbon action um, at an October 4th uh, council meeting and hope to engage with you on some of these before then. Uh, looking at resiliency practices achieving carbon neutrality by the year 2035, we'll be talking about what some uh, areas of progress might be uh, that we can take in the near term and then our longer term actions. Um, communicating our efforts to the community, uh, to individuals and businesses in support of this work. Um, just today, uh, the social media um, elves have gone live with uh, the climate action speaker series. Uh, that we're kicking off. We have uh, some uh, scholars and subject matter experts uh, speaking virtually to the Tigard and broader community about things like climate adaptation, what cities can do to address uh, warming, um, warming cities, heat events, uh, from Dr. Shandas of uh, PSU. Uh, we have uh, our friend and colleague at PGE, uh, Troy Gagliano, speaking about uh, energy grants and opportunities for residences, business owners, uh, the, uh, some of the ways that the city is partnering with PGE. Uh, and we have TriMet also on deck to hopefully tell us more about uh, some of their efforts. So um, speakers are being added all the time. Stay tuned. Uh, finally, our regional partnerships uh, to reduce carbon uh, throughout the Portland Metro. We're working closely with our partners in uh, sister cities, uh, neighboring cities across the region, as well as uh, other agencies. So on the next slide, I'd love to share some specific accomplishments. As I mentioned, uh, our consultant uh, team has completed the data modeling specific for Tigard. Uh, we'll be sharing some of that data with you here soon, and it'll be part of the council presentation, uh, the report on October 4th. Um, some of the low carbon actions that have been identified are things that we can do within uh, the city, within city business itself. So ways that we can uh, walk the talk and embrace sustainability in some of the things that we do, for example, considering prioritizing um, low carbon or local vendors, uh, for example. Uh, considering uh, active transportation or other modes, um, the ways in which we uh, build and develop new municipal facilities or how we might retrofit some of our existing buildings. Um, I also wanted to share with you uh, uh, successful meetings with our BIPOC task force that just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago. We got some really interesting feedback. And what's important, since the beginning, we've been talking about being equity-centered in this work and making sure that we consider the needs of these groups in implementing climate action, uh, particularly frontline communities that bear the brunt of uh, heat events, uh, rising costs of uh, gasoline or energy bills, and things like that. I wanted to share just quickly a couple of items of feedback we got from these communities. Uh, something to keep in mind is to be uh, thoughtful about uh, uh, shifting to active transportation. Uh, some members of our BIPOC community have talked about being threatened or harassed uh, being on bicycles. 
Uh, some have talked about the availability um, and access to transit if you have multiple jobs. Uh, and so thinking about uh, what um, tools are available to us to make it easier to choose less emitting options, for example. Um, finally, I mentioned a moment ago about the Climate Speaker Series, um, which uh, we also hope to be recording uh, these presentations, so you're, if you're unable to join, you can uh, tune in at a later date. And then the ongoing uh, excellent work from Mike Lewick and others around hazard mitigation and disaster preparedness. That'll be part of our conversations going forward. So just a quick plug, August 17th at 6 in the evening will be our first presentation uh, from the speaker series talking about um, adaptation to a warming planet. PGE will be a presentation August 24th. And so we'll share that information online as well. Thank you very much. I'll pass it off to Rick to talk about goal four. Thank you, Emily. Good, uh, good afternoon or good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council. I'm Rick Ruin, Parks, Recreation, and Green Infrastructure Manager. Along with Brian Rager, we're heading up Goal 4, which is the adoption of the Parks and Recreation System Plan and moving forward with a developing a realistic and cost-effective funding plan and service delivery model. Uh, we met last on January 25th with the adoption of the system plan, and at that time, Council directed us to move forward with developing the implementation plan. We divided our work into three buckets, if you will. One is to focus on prioritizing our projects. The second is to do a rate analysis and consider different uh, funding alternatives. And the third is to look at the uh, cost-effective uh, delivery model of how uh, Calgary Parks and Recreation can move forward into the future sustainably and uh, cost effectively. Uh, we were intending to uh, make a recommendation and report to council in September. Here we are uh, on August 9th and uh, want to share uh, that we most likely won't be able to meet the September deadline due to uh, teammate vacancies, critical teammate vacancies in finance and public works. Uh, but we are continuing our work as uh, best we can. Right now, we are currently underway on project prioritization task. And some of the accomplishments were uh, that are underway with our consulting team. Uh, if you recall in the system plan, uh, there was an appendix F which uh, detailed future capital projects. We're going back through this uh, appendix F, the project list, and refining those uh, capital projects, as well as adding uh, future uh, recreation programming opportunities. So we're developing the cost models for, for these. Uh, we're looking at the categories of costs for our capital projects, uh, it's one thing to say we can fund a project with SDCs or grants or Metro local share dollars, but what's critically important as we look at our uh, projects and future delivery of those is what are the gaps in funding? Is it you know looking at staffing levels, looking at operation and maintenance? Anytime we deliver a capital project, whether it's a new park, or upgrading an existing park, it does come with a uh, cost of potential increase in operation and maintenance or staffing uh, to maintain the high level of service that our Tigard community has enjoyed in experiencing our parks throughout uh, Tigard. At the same time, we're also developing our project criteria. Uh, we have no shortage of future projects that we would love to deliver, uh, but we also need a decision matrix to prioritize which projects to recommend for advancing. Some of the criteria that we're looking at using is, as you might recall from our system plan, there was some gaps in the community that uh, did not meet our 10 minute walkability goal. So we look at gap area of service, 
We look at our underserved communities, uh, equity and accessibility are key components of our system plan. Uh, it's important to look not only at our system development charges for delivering projects, but what other funding sources can we leverage? So we'll be recognizing grant opportunities uh, to include with our projects. A couple of the other criteria are uh, as we look to put the lens together, strategic opportunities uh, and relationships to other projects so that we can get a leveraging effect. Uh, oftentimes that might mean, can we develop a, a trail along with the park? Uh, it's one thing to build a park, but it's also important to figure out ways to perhaps leverage with our trail system plan, uh, ways to bring folks to, uh, to our parks, not just by car, but by bike or uh, other modes of transportation. So uh, we will continue uh, to update council with our uh, biweekly memos. And another one of the delays that we've experienced, again, with uh, staffing constraints is uh, moving forward with this trail system plan. What we are including, uh, I think we've mentioned previously, uh, including strategies for enhancing uh, trail safety as we uh, look to uh, upgrade or update the trial system plan. Brian, did you have anything to add? Thank you, Rick. I think you covered it very well. Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Gruen. And actually, I'm going to I'm going to take us back to goal one and actually some feedback about hybrid meeting here just in general is that we I would have wanted to sort of stop after goal one I couldn't really interject with Nicole because she was already going so just as a it, it is much harder to sort of like have the the cue the the nonverbal cues and things in this environment so just as a future when we've got presenters doing both we probably need especially around the goals like I would suggest we always kind of go goal by goal just because we're now going to be going all the way back through the goals again um, just from an efficiency standpoint so um, let's go to questions i know mr gruen asked about questions about goal four but we're going to go back to goal one uh, to start with if that's okay so i know there was at least one counselor goodhouse you had a question on goal one yeah the question on goal one and i guess it kind of links into <clears throat> the COVID dollars as well um, I know, I think it was yesterday or, or day before I met, I sent uh, City Manager Reimer uh, an email. Uh, the Downtown Alliance was wondering, they, um, a couple months ago they sent a letter out and I think the council got it, but there's a list of things they were wanting to see downtown and maybe possibly ARPA money, but also having to do with homelessness. And they were just curious the response to that. Now that we have Sarah, that might be something that Sarah can meet with the TDA, but they're really concerned about um, still kind of the ebb and flow of, of homeless down there uh, and, and the problems were there where when you see Portland do something with a the camp, then we see more people coming down there. And they, they think they sent that letter a couple months ago with no response. So I know that ties into homeless, but it also ties into possibly ways of spending that, that money. And now that we kind of have that categorized and that's going, I know they did have a request. And I don't know if that did get sent to the council, that letter. Um, if not, it might be a good refresher to send it back out to the council. Um, but a, a, some kind of an update would be uh, great to the TDA, at least to say, here's where our timeline is to get back to you and go over some of these concerns that the, the Main Street businesses or the whole downtown area um, has. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, you thank you, Councillor uh, Goodhouse. We, um, as part of the onboarding with Sarah Cooper, we did um, essentially inundate her with all of the letters and the reports and whatnot. So that is definitely on her portfolio. And we will be making those introductions to both the chamber and the TDA so she can start fostering those relationships. And we do have a tracker as far as each of the items that were mentioned in the chamber and TDA's letter of status and whatnot. So we can provide an update. As Chief mentioned, um, we're hoping to come back, back for a fuller um, presentation about activities and accomplishments in goal one so we can give you an update of where we are 
on that. As mentioned, Sarah's been here all of two weeks and um, she keeps coming back, which is great. And her plate, her plate is definitely full. And we're also um, working closely with the economic development team as they do outreach, um, making sure like whatever they hear is passed along to us as far as public safety and um, the community that might be perceived as unhoused. So we've, and one of the things that Sarah and the team is also working on is establishing that, that cadence for communication. We've updated our website. We try to do weekly updates about what's going on and um, have provided those contacts to both the chamber and TDA. We will continue to do that. So it is very much on our radar and we will include that in our future um, report out. Thank you, and, and thank you for mentioning the chamber because that also that letter uh, represented the rest of the Tigard and community with businesses and so forth. May, Mayor, if I if I may yeah, just go add ahead. to what uh, Sun City Manager Nyland said, I had a great one-on-one -on -one with uh, Sarah today, and um, we talked in general. Uh, but one of the key things we both agreed on was that relationships and timely communication were high priority, and um, she embraced that. Um, she lives that, I believe, too, and so. Um, we've talked about TDA, the chamber, and just the community in general, right? Those that are unhoused and those that are owning businesses and other community members. So I would anticipate um, much more of an emphasis in that area. Um, as Chief said earlier, having the capacity and someone that can really spend that time and ensure day in and day out the communications there. So just to pass it on. All right, thank you. Anything else on goal one? Uh, Councilor Shaw? Great, thank you, and thank you for the report, uh, Assistant City Manager Nyland. Perhaps you can also mention there's the upcoming chart uh, committee meeting that's going to be happening. I think that's important to let the community know that the, there's a committee that's working on this and it's to meet soon. Thank you. That is, thank you for mentioning that, Councilor Shaw. Um, we will be convening the chart gathering, I believe, on August. Um, 17th and our hope is to again establish a regular frequency for meeting and really brainstorming and soliciting that feedback to help develop recommendations and a strategy moving forward so August 17th all right anything else on goal one all right goal two Councillor Newton I'll get the hang of it. Um, so just a quick question, maybe this goes to Nicole, but um, the team all through COVID, our team has done a really good job of keeping their ear on the ground, so to speak, about what the community residents and businesses need in terms of support to get through COVID. So I'm hoping that as we continue to get through this, that um, the team is also tuned in to what we're hearing from our economic development team or just from folks that are still having difficulty with utilities, whatever it is, something that I haven't thought of, so that we can quickly get to the council if we need to, to in, in case we do need to allocate funding to support something. So I, I just don't want to lose that if, if that's still a need out in our community with either businesses or residents or both. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. And we are keeping track and keeping in tune and we have our own trackers. And so, yeah, as soon as we hear things, we'll be sure to come to council if um, if there is that large need. Um, so thank you for the reminder. All right, anything else on goal two? All right, goal three, I have one, but do others? Uh, on goal three, uh, I have heard multiple community members uh, indicate that they really think that while this, you know, the, the, the focus of that goal right now is m seems to be mostly sort of internally focused, that they really think that the city should be using the goal both to be a demonstration but also to push the entire community and I just wanted to share that feedback because I've not heard it from like one person I've heard it from a lot of people um, and I don't know what others are hearing but I think we would be uh, potentially in the long run kind of missing the mark and not having as big of an impact as we could if we don't listen to that so just just a comment there yeah I, I'd love to respond to that um, 
So we haven't had the chance uh, to share some of our uh, recommendations with the community yet, but we are looking forward uh, to doing so. We have had many conversations with our community advisory committee as well as the technical advisory committee. And those conversations have focused entirely on uh, the ways that uh, this uh, city, you all in particular, can influence the broader community by introducing new policy, incentives, and actions. Uh, we have talked about things like modifying or prioritizing active transportation in our CIP, for example. We have talked about policies uh, such as, um, uh, just to, to lay out some of the bold, the bold actions, uh, as extreme as uh, um, cordon areas or having uh, uh, pr uh, priority parking areas for electric vehicles or non-emitting vehicles. Uh, um, requirements for, uh, as I say, for new development. So we've been looking at everything from, uh, I think you might remember uh, several weeks ago, uh, the, the thematic bubbles that we talked about, everything from uh, solid waste uh, to buildings, energy, transportation, and so on and so forth, even how we get our food, um, so things like that. Uh, so we have been entirely externally focused, and in fact, our internal um, Tiger team only recently started identifying things that the city could do for itself to set a good model, right, showing that we are really motivated and wanting to set a, a good example, having our house in order sort of thing. So uh, while we do talk about electrifying our fleet as a near-term priority, it was something that we had thought about doing even before this goal, we are really uh, trying to be impactful on the broader community, and you'll see that as we bring forward our recommendations. Thank you. Council President Loop. Yeah, thank you. It's something that I've been thinking out, especially, you know, with this community resiliency plan. I really hope that it changes the way that we as counselors and the mayor think about the decisions that we make and view everything through this lens. And so one thing that I'd actually like to see in our agenda items is right when it talks about financial impact, I'd like to see what if there's a climate impact to our decision and what that would be. So we start to think of all of the decisions through that lens of what the impact is. Um, I think that would have a huge impact overall when you can see it on paper, um, what it would be. Thank you. I'd add the equity impact too. If you're gonna start adding ways to be thinking about things, you might as well get all of what we wanna be looking at in. Councilor Goodhouse. Well, and with that part, it was mentioned um, with, with bus, bus routes and so forth. I mean, that's a huge part. I mean, we have it in there, but really to have more of a relationship with TriMet and to really find out more of what we need. I mean, that's the biggest thing that we hear all the time is people either can get their job but can't get back or vice versa, or, or students can't get to the high school. I mean, if they're talking about using public transit, there's not really, there is kind of a close stop, but there's not, but there's not a, uh, we don't have a thorough bus system throughout Tigard. We talk about it, but actually we're reducing routes. And so when we talk about wanting to be able to do this, but we don't have the routes when, you know, really a conversation with TriMet and pushing on that. So sometimes maybe we're not looking as much of a cost, but really looking at what can we do to get those, those, those routes throughout here. Absolutely, Councillor. Thank, thank you for that. And, and I think we've got some really great partners uh, in TriMet and, and other agencies to, to make progress on these with. All right, Councillor Shaw. Great, thank you, and thank you, excellent report. Also, um, a nod to thank you for including both the hazardous materials, but also the nod towards uh, natural disasters, such as potentially Cascadia subduction zone, so thank you very much. Anything else on goal three? Mayor, if I can just yeah, add, go ahead. Um, just to um, kind of emphasize what the comments you've been hearing. Internally, I have not been as part of as many of the discussions as others, um, but we've been trying to frame it in how bold does the council want to be, right? And so I use the example once of the font size. So as, you're, as we're talking to you, you can think of a font size of 72 bold, 18 bold, 36 bold. So as, and those will all drive those type of decisions that lead to ongoing decision making, the policies you put in place, future development for this community, uh, retrofitting. There's a lot of options you're going to be hearing coming up. And so, um, We'll be talking about uh, knowing the council wants bold. How bold, you know, do you want to be? Is it a phase bold? And so we'll we'll get into that. But I think it's important to start to think of that word that was emphasized during your goal setting. Um, and I, I I mean I can picture it today. It's through a screen, but I can picture Council President Lube and others really um, underscoring bold. And so we will be bringing forward those things that hopefully start to address some of the things you're hearing from the community. All right. Uh, anything else on goal three? We'll go to goal four. And Mr. Gruen's question can now be considered. 
<laughs> Questions or comments on goal four? Council President Lube. I just, I mean, I guess this could technically go in council liaison reports too. Last night, uh, the Parks and Recreation Board actually had a field trip for our um, monthly meeting. And it was really interesting to go ahead and see a bunch of the parks in River Terrace and upcoming parks and the discussions that we were having as far as water quality water quality facilities next to parks and what that means and these parks that are coming on. Um, it was just, it was a really in-depth, powerful conversation that I think really feeds into this plan of what we want parks and recreation to look like, and especially talking about the cost and the cost of some of these parks that we're taking on. Um, there's one that just has a really steep incline and we were standing there talking with Carla and it was like, well, how is someone actually going to be up there maintaining that? And it becomes this really long in-depth discussion of um, you know, this, this plan and, and these upcoming parks and where our priorities are. So I just wanted to share that um, outside of this, you know, the, the Parks and Rec Board is also actively participating um, in reviewing it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on goal four? All right, thank you team. Appreciate all the report outs. Youth Councilor Nog, you were awfully quiet. I almost called on you. Do you wanna, I guess I'll call on you. You wanna, sh you have any questions or comments on any of the goals? Um, I personally, I'm taking notes and I have some like ideas I want to reach out okay. afterwards. So you're gonna, you're gonna insert your thoughts into these after the meeting? I mean, I can. Um, one of the things for council goal one that I wanted to kind of think about was implementing like a free fridge program. I know that Portland has a couple of free fridge food, like uh, to have accessible food for people if they need something. And I used to volunteer with Pack with Pride and there is a lot of food waste there, which if we can implement some sort of city run program to take the unused food there, a lot of the times it's just like the expiry date doesn't align with the Oregon Food Bank's program. There was a way to take those, uh, I guess, th that food and have a place to implement it throughout the city for people who are dealing with food insecurity that would deal with um, like a huge problem in our city, I think. And I think and for the second thing is I would love to host another um, a park cleanup or something or like a hall street cleanup to kind of go around with council goal four okay. and three. So city team, I hope you were hearing or hearing youth councilor Nog's feedback there and we'll get that to the appropriate folks. I'm glad I called on you. You gotta, you gotta let me know when you got your thoughts. I'm having to pull it out of you. It's okay. Okay. Yes, uh, and I can respond that we did indeed hear um, Youth Councilor Nog and addressing food insecurity is definitely on the list of um, that intersects both goal one, goal two, goal three, and goal four. So um, you have been heard and it's on our radar. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to item number seven on the agenda, which is tar Tiger Charter Review and an introduction on this, uh, City Attorney Rahala. Thank you, Council. So this is really your first introduction to the upcoming Charter Review. Um, as you will recall, last time we were discussing the Charter was in the context of the uh, interpretation of consecutive terms at that consecutive years. Uh, at that time, it was pointed out that that was not the only section in our charter that was uh, ambiguous or confusing. And the recommendation was to come forward with a charter review committee. So this is really just the first introduction to kind of get those conversations started. Um, we have a couple of high level questions to ask tonight just to kind of get the wheels turning. And then the plan is that we'll come back for a workshop uh, next month I believe September 19th, uh, and have a more in-depth conversation. So to start off, we're really looking at the scope. Uh, so the first question is, uh, are we looking at just specific sections or the charter as a whole? Uh, staff's recommendation is the charter as a whole. 
but want to confirm that with you. And then getting an idea of membership of the committee and how many members, uh, composition, selection of members, those kind of things. Kind of, if you have uh, strong feelings about that, that would be helpful. And then if there's anything that we should keep in mind as we kind of start to piece this together, that would also be helpful. So that's it for the presentation. <laughs> this is really uh, just a time for you to kind of give your initial thoughts and then like I said, we'll be back next month uh, with some more formed recommendations once we hear what is of value to you. Okay, well that is pretty open-ended. <clears throat> uh, do we wanna try to start with the, maybe we can just discuss the charter as a whole versus particular sections. There's enough sections that I just, I think I know are like just either super problematic uh, all the way to just not flat, not accurate anymore for how the city does business. So to me, it's pretty simple to answer that question, but I want to put it out to the rest of the council, of course. Councilor Newton. Yeah, when I was reviewing the charter for the discussion we had, it occurred to me it looked like sections were put in at different times, which is true. Right. <laughs> so uh, they didn't really mesh that well, so I think it's important to review the charter as a whole. Councilor Goodhouse? I agree as a whole. I mean, if we're doing it, then look at it all at once rather than having to come back. Councilor President Lou? As a whole. Councilor Shop? As a whole as well. Youth Councilor Nog? As a whole, and I think it would be like useful to look into language as well to kind of like update the language as the charter review process happens. And I guess I'll make the just sort of hit the point home about the as a whole and Councillor Newton's point about things being you know changed over time. <clears throat> I've been pretty silent about what's gone on over the last six or eight months around term limits etc. Um, but I think the as a whole is super important because I, I have to be honest, I think where things ended up would put the city and, you know, I've not pushed this issue so far, um, but I think where things ended up probably violate the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And I think that could be really problematic. So whatever we do in the future, I don't know if the you know, impacted party would be as uh, sort of accepting as perhaps I have been. So I, I think that that's just one more reason why the whole thing needs to be taken as a whole. So it sounds like we got an answer there. Uh, let's see. Membership of a charter review committee. Do we want to hit that one? Yeah, so for committee membership, um, so we're looking for kind of size, um, what you think would be a good ballpark number, um, what types of members, are we looking for all community members? Um, the mayor and I had discussed having uh, some continuity with past counselors, past mayors to provide uh, the context from their perspective, having lived it before. Um, so kind of what makeup of, uh, people, representatives, uh, would council be interested in having? And then also is the anticipation that this council would select those members or uh, the future council? And just timing wise, we would support this council, but again, deferring, uh, making sure that that's consistent with your thoughts as well. Yeah, so good questions. And I guess you've already sort of started to propose what I, <laughs> you shared some of my thoughts. Uh, so I'll let others go first. Councillor Shaw. Thank you, and again, um, thank you, City Attorney Rahala. Open-ended questions. I think it's important to have a perspective from the past, but I'd want to make sure that it isn't um, overly so. Yeah. Uh, uh, to Youth Councillor Nog's point, there's a lot of changes, terminology being one. So I would hope that we could have um, members who maybe one or two represent the past, but also those who represent the current, um, even council, and then community members as well. Perhaps we even model it after PSAB, um, though I'd wanna open it up to perhaps more council members, but also conscious of state law, what you can and can't do during open meetings. Uh, but I think that will be key. 
Thank you. And oh, one last point. Uh, I think as much as we can do with this council before uh, January of 2023 for the new council, so that's not something they too have to take on, I think would be advisable. Thank you. As far as setting it, just to be clear, to, as far as setting up the structure, okay. Uh, Councilor Goodhouse. Thank you. Um, size limit, I think it would be kind of hard, but I'm thinking off the top of my head, eight to 12 or something like that. I think that there's good to have um, some of the institutional knowledge where you have a person or two from the past to see why things were written, but then also to break it down. Um, you know, I think we want a wide variety, kind of like similar to what um, Councilor Shaw said with PSAB, um, but we're probably gonna want probably an attorney on there, someone or, or two. Um, you're gonna want people from different demographics of the community too. So making sure what's written is gonna be able to also be inclusive from everyone that may be running or affected by it. So we wanna make sure that we kind of get a wide range of all different demographics in our community. Um, someone from the legal part, you get some elected apart. Um, and I, I, maybe I might be missing something, but make sure we kind of get the different perspectives from all those different angles. You know, maybe a nonprofit, maybe business, maybe, um, you, know, you know, maybe faith-based. Just get a, kind of a mixture of everything in the community. And I think we'd also, I don't know if we want to set a timeline as far as what timeline we want it to be done and then to have kind of a timeline of when it then would go to a, a ballot or how, how that would look. And if it would, it would go all together or break out into sections, um, but I'd like to see as much if it can be done with this council. Council President Lube. Um, I certainly like the idea of having a good amount of people on it. I, I'm just throwing it out there, potentially even like the budget committee where the council is a part of it. And then I would say to put six community members. And so then it's 11 people and the balance of power goes to the community members. Um, I think could be really interesting. I, I don't necessarily agree with having to have specific um, demographics on there. I think um, we have a city attorney who could advise the group if something happens to go astray. Um, she's very good at keeping us on track. Um, but just a wide variety of opinions and experience um, I think would be really helpful from the community perspective. Councilor Newton. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm thinking a bigger number like PSAB, but that's in um, thinking about having a counselor or two plus somebody from the past, you know, a past elected official. I'm also going to nominate the city recorder because there's an expertise there that I think having on the PSAB, sorry, Carol, but um, on the PSAB having some, you know, professional expertise, yeah, professional was expertise was important. And I think the PSAB a way it worked really well because the folks, they went through a little bit more intense application process than we normally do for our boards and committees. So I, I kind of like that. You so think it, that'd be good to incorporate Yeah, I think it would go good because it impacts our whole community. And that way we can look at folks who might be younger and um, you know, maybe English isn't their first language, you know, so we could get a variety. So, and, and I would like to start it with this council, um, just because I think to get the work plan and everything kind of kicked off to articulate it for the committee would be important. And I would want to set some sort of a timeline because, you know, we don't want it to drag on forever. It was really good to have the PSAB with the expectation to be done in 18 months because they established a work plan and really really work through it. And so those those are my thoughts. I don't think I missed anything. Yeah, I think that, you know, part of why we're talking about it now is I had the, I mean, in my discussions as a city attorney and the city manager, like we need to move this forward right. and it would take a new council six to eight to 12 months to like kind of move this stuff forward, especially with how much turnover we're gonna have um, no matter what. So it it seemed like this council was the right place to get it set up. Um, so I agree with that. Councilor Goodhouse. I do have two more questions. One is how's the meeting going to be ran? Is it going to be something similar to PSAB where we have a mediator or someone that's going to be overseeing it and running the process? Um, or how's that going to be done? And then the second question, I guess, um, kind of uh, Council President uh, Lou brought up was, um, 
is what's the council's involvement? Is it going to be letting this committee decide and then council being the overall determining factor of, of what goes forward? Or do we do it where the council's on that and then it's decided that that? So I guess that's going to be a question we have to figure out is, is, is it decided and what that committee comes up with is said and then we approve it? Or do we be part of it and then that way it's I think that can be part of the discussion. But I, you know, the council, I think, ultimately is going to have to decide what it's putting on the ballot. Yeah, so that's so where the council will ultimately, whatever council seated when it completes its work, you know, is going to have discretion around what's done, but we can probably set up what the objectives are as this council and, you know, try to get the work off and it's on sort of a good path to get the work done, but it's certainly not going to be going to the ballot before we're done as a seated council now. So I would anticipate it taking at least a year. What do you think, City Attorney Rahala? Yeah, I think we were, I, I think we were hoping for November 23. Okay. Balance. So start it now and it'd be a, about a year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On, on the comment about participation from the current council um, or just members of the council, I think one or two from the current council is plenty. I think that getting much broader community participation is really important in this kind of a foundational document and foundational decision making. I understand Council President Lube's point, um, and I think there should be some continuity, but I think one or two members is probably adequate in my opinion. Councilor Goodhouse? And one last part I was going to throw in there too is what what part beyond the committee would community involvement be? Would there be a part where through the process that community could either come in and, and, and either give their feedback to the committee or would it wait till the end where then council did it? So I think we'd have to weigh that in because obviously something this large, the community is going to obviously want to give input. So is that something that's going to be worked into the model where maybe the first meeting or, or through a process, we have some kind of a community involvement that they can also throw feedback or comments or see if it's going the right direction compared to what we think the community is going. I'm gonna it, step in here, because I think the way you're giving, you're asking questions that I think should probably just be input to the process. I don't know that the city attorney is prepared to answer that type of a question, and I think we all would have input on it. So I would just be stating these things as sort of things you wanna see in the process. Oh, yeah, 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 there's more seeing it. Okay. So. Do you have other comments, other ones around that? Okay. Mr. Mayor, really quick. Sorry, Councillor oh, Newman. Sorry. Um, I agree with you. I think a couple of councillors is good. I noticed it took the PSAP a little bit to include me as a member. You know, I made... <laughs> they, I insisted, they didn't... You had to earn your... Well, I insisted that they call me Liz. You know, there was a lot of, well, city councillor, you know, and all that. So <laughs> I think that, I think that um, it would be better to keep it to two. I think two would be good, but I don't know that you want the whole council plus a few community members. Yeah, and we, and we need to be broken. thinking about is that, if, is that members of the council that start next year or is that members of this council? I mean, by the time they get running, it's going to be next year's council likely or most of it. Um, so just things like that need to be worked sure, out. Sure, we too. can talk about that. But I mean, by the time the by the time the committee gets la really launched, it might be getting close to the election, and we right. would not, we would maybe use somebody from the existing council and a new council. I don't know. Yeah. But that's something we could work. But out things with. to think about. Yeah. Or, or maybe a prior assistant city manager that really knows all. <laughs> <laughs> I I will just say, as you're thinking about it. Uh, I did say to the city attorney that once I'm off the council, I might be a good former member of the city council to consider, just, just to get that out there. I might be willing to serve. I don't know. I have to think about it, but Councilor Shaw. Well, since we're throwing things out, given that I'm the newest member and will be continuing until the mm -hmm. next, perhaps I too would be a good, a good from choice. current okay. to new. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and I also think that, uh, frankly, either prior Mayor Cook or prior Mayor Dirksen would be a good, I mean, I know Mayor Dirksen had to sort of live through a lot of mess prior to my involvement on the actual city council. And so he, he, he may have some 
valuable insights and opinions that may be useful as well. You're right, Mr. Mayor. I think he was involved in every iteration of appointment, election, how long you wait, do you... People wait, dying yeah, in office, multiple yeah. people dying in office yeah, right. is a very interesting time in Taggart. Okay. Um, City Attorney Rahala, have we provided you enough direction? I don't know that we really answered the, thi the, the other things to consider. Did you get enough of those? Or? So I have one more question on the committee selection. Okay. Uh, so there was a reference to a PSAB-like application process that was a little more intensive than a usual yeah. board and committee process. Is that consistent? I think for what we're talking about doing, probably. Yeah, so if there's anything else that you can think of that we should keep in mind for our initial brainstorming, uh, if not, we'll be back next month with some more ideas. Some more work on that, more detail. Yep. Okay, or more detailed recommendations. All right, thank you for all the work on that and bringing it forward. And City Manager Reimer, do you have an administrative report? Yes, I do, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you again. Uh, to start, I want to just uh, my personal thanks to the PSAB, uh, the community members, our teammates, and others that have been part of this, Councillor Newton. In my career, this is the most genuine, authentic, comprehensive community engagement process that I've ever seen. Um, you heard the stories today, um, the vulnerability of a police department uh, going through this, um, really having honest conversations. and. Like I said, uh, as we talk about in our profession, what is community engagement? That's that's community engagement. I think Tiger can hold that up high for years to come to say this is how you do it. And it's been referenced. Um, I just want to personally say thanks to all of you uh, for the vision to do it, as well as everyone for being part of that, including the city attorney. So thank you. Uh, kudos to uh, Youth Councilor Nog as well for bringing forward the National Honor Society Blood Drive. She's asked if we can help spread the word. So that is coming up on August 30th. Uh, Red Cross will be in town. Uh, there's still some spots left, I believe, 10 spots or so, and everyone will receive a $10 e-gift card for participating. So I think if you need more information, Youth Council Nod can probably assist, or the National Honor Society students as well. So thanks for bringing that forward to us. We appreciate it. Also, uh, kudos to the police department. The chief uh, in her report today talked about what we're experiencing. Obviously having uh, the levy funding, um, we were happy to have our most recent swearing in of uh, Thea O'Rourke um, as an entry level police officer. She has already been with us as a record specialist, so it's always great to see a teammate work their way through the organization. In this case, obviously become a police officer and she will be attending the uh, basic law enforcement academy that's on or starts on September 12th. So. Uh, welcome uh, to her again, and it's great, like I said, to see a teammate work their way through our organization. A couple updates from our library. Uh, Halsta and team are great with providing us um, updates every week as well as serving our community. So just a few things. The library strategic plan was the topic at the most recent uh, Tigered Breakfast uh, Rotary, and uh, one of the comments that came out of it at the end is, I thought my smartphone had replaced anything I could find at the library, but I was wrong. And so the team did a nice job, obviously, communicating the value, the value of library services. Uh, we've been talking all along about our summer reading program. Um, as of the end of July, we had 2,332 uh, young children and teens signed up for the summer reading program, which was uh, greater than last year's number of 2,188. And so seeing progress in that. And that just goes back to, obviously, engaging the community, making them aware of the services that we're providing. Uh, we've also served 683 meals uh, to kids that are 0 to 18 at the library courtyard as far as our partnership with TTSD. We haven't probably talked about this enough, but this is one of those times where we learned uh, that that opportunity was not going to be provided to our, our residents, and the library team literally jumped in in a split second and got this program off the ground. And so uh, kudos to all of them for filling that gap and not not trying to figure out how we're going to do it, but just jumped in and said we are going to do it. And so I think it's a reflection of, of their dedication to this organization, this community. Which goes to my last point, obviously we've been experiencing a lot of heat, and so uh, the library has served as our cooling center. We've also helped out with our, uh, during the meals that I just referenced, making sure uh, that our families were cool and popsicles and all the different things that we could do to make sure that our community in many different ways was served during the heat. 
with some additional heat that may be coming our way, and so we'll just continue to work on that. And the cooling center is an effort, obviously, of the entire organization, the libraries, the location, uh, but it takes many teammates throughout that to make it happen. And so just want to say thank you uh, to everyone for that. And that concludes my report, and I really like giving these in person, much better than staring at a screen. So thank you. Thank you, City Manager Reimer. I don't think we have any non-agenda items. Uh, Tiger City Council at this time will enter, new, in, enter into executive session to discuss the performance-related review of a public officer or employee under ORS 192.660, subsection 2I. All discussions are confidential, and those present may disclose nothing from the session. No executive session may be held for the purpose of taking any final action or making any final decision. The City Council will adjourn after the executive session.